I started writing this video script on the same morning when I woke up to yet and another Superman related bad news and thought, okay, might as well start working on this. Superman Red Sun is a three issues long comic book miniseries written by Mark Millar based on the premise of what if the original Golden Age Superman had been raised in the Soviet Union. According to the comics Wikipedia page, Mark Millar had this story idea since he was six years old and had pitched the story to DC Comics first when he was 13, with Grant Morrison also claiming that HAN gave Millar the idea how the story ends. More about that later in the video. The comic was published under DC's Elseworlds imprint in 2003, just to hammer it home that it is not changing Superman's backstory to those people who didn't know what DC Multiverse is back in 2003. And in March 2020, right around the time when that thing I have also caught and survived from struck, Warner Bros. Animation and DC Entertainment adapted it into an 84 minute long animated movie. And back then I had recently graduated from college, moved into my current apartment and was starting out doing YouTube stuff, because I no longer had anything resembling homework to keep me busy when I came home. Because of those early projects I was doing, I somehow ended up ignoring the Superman Red Sun movie's release, but some time ago, someone asked or suggested in some of my videos comment to cover it. Or so I think because going over all the comments that I have gotten, I failed to find out who that someone was. Any Anyway, like with the, my previous comic to adaptation video on Yura's contract, I'm going to go over those THANK GOD IT'S ONLY THREE ISSUES first, and then I'm going to record myself watching the movie, to get the footage for editing, and to have something to dump onto my eventual Patreon page, if I ever get around into making one. Enough filler talk, let's just get into this Elseworld story. Superman Red Sun issue number one. The comic starts in 1953 with a retrospective narration and first revealing to the readers that Lois Lane is married to Lex Luthor while still working as a reporter for Daily Planet. Perry White calls her up by calling to inform Lois that Washington is giving them a scoop on a brand new superweapon that the Soviet Union has developed. And I'll just cut to the point where that superweapon is revealed to be Superman, whom the CIA agent James Olsen reports to have supposedly landed into Ukraine 30 years ago. With Superman as the new superpower in the Soviet Union's hands, the Cold War has evolved to that point where the US Army, CIA and FBI are now obsolete, with Lex Luthor and Star Labs being the only ones whom President of the United States can call for help. Also, the characterization of this version of Lex Luthor must have been another inspiration, along with Superman Birthright version, behind Jesse Eisenberg's version as neither of them seem to be able to turn their brains off. Also, the CIA agent Jimmy Olsen looks exactly like that one senator that Luthor made to eat from his hand in BBS. Anyway, while reading the newspaper article on the space race, Luthor gets the bright idea to have the American sabotage Sputnik 2 so that it will crash land onto Metropolis. As the internal monologue narration by now has been revealed to belong to Superman, he explains in that narration that, even when he was not raised by the Kents, he still feels that he has to fight for what is right and goes to make sure it lands into the river. He does a messy job of it, in explaining to still having been new to his powers at this point of his life, and ends up causing the globe on top of Daily Planet building to fall, before catching it and letting the Americans to see him as he is rather than as he has been told to be. Superman also comes face to face with Lois as he catches the bronze globe, but whatever sexual tension there could have been can't happen because she is a married woman now. Regardless, Superman's actions in America left his biological material into the wreckage of Sputnik 2, and Luthor uses that to create Bizarro. Weeks later in Moscow, Josef Stalin throws Superman up a raid that he cannot attend much because he keeps hearing disasters happening here and there. In Superman's absence, Stalin converges with Captain Peter Roslov, who is supposed to be a version of Pete Ross and is established to be vocally jealous of Superman possibly taking over the leadership of the Soviet Union from Stalin. Peter is also established to have been one of Stalin's illegitimate children. Sometime later, Comrade Stalin is shown 
entertaining Queen Hippolyta and her Amazons visiting Moscow on a diplomatic mission, as Russia is now the stronger superpower than the US would have been in the mainstream DC continuity, which also includes the not yet Wonder Woman version of Diana. Stalin later talks to Superman about him and Diana starting a dynasty of superpowered people, but Superman is more interested in the absence of Captain Roslov, whom he later discovers drunk and shooting at a scarecrow. This scene temporarily eases the tension Roslov and Superman have as rivals in becoming the leader of the Soviet Union, as Roslov, while drunk, unloads his insecurities in feeling inadequate as Stalin's bodyguard when Superman exists. Superman responds to this by telling Roslov that he didn't get his powers until he was 12, and Roslov then confesses to having killed political dissidents spreading anti-Superman leaflets, with the look in their surviving son's eye still haunting him, and that unnamed boy is then foreshadowed to grow up to become Batman. Then Roslov tries to shoot himself, but Superman stops him, which causes Roslov to confess something that Superman won't stay to listen, because he hears that Stalin has been poisoned with cyanide. Stalin does not survive this, and Superman might guess that Roslov arranged his poisoning as a heat of the moment decision that he regrets now, but Superman does not confront him about it, and a scapegoat is told to have been publicly executed off screen. Meanwhile, Luthor has managed to create his Bizarro clone, who is just unoriginally dubbed as Superman 2, and is used as a bodyguard for an American nuclear submarine. And then when they come across Superman in the Soviet airspace, or Soviet waters, depending on who you ask, the language barrier calls them to use the international sign language, which scares the crew of the nuclear sub to launch a nuke at Great Britain. Their Superman verbally and physically manages to beat Bizarro up to the point where it realizes that their confrontation caused the nuke to be fired at Britain, and uses its freeze vision to keep Superman in one place as Bizarro goes to make that nuke blow up in space. Also, look at the art on this page. I had to google London landmarks to find out that this could be St. Paul's Cathedral, but looking at this next panel, why does this trajectory look like Bizarro? flew out from northeast coast of the United States, instead of from the Great Britain, where this scene is supposed to be taking place. Anyway, following Bizarro's heroic sacrifice, Joseph Stalin is buried on, quote, the third Tuesday of November 1953, end quote, and during the funeral, Superman catches a glimpse of a familiar face in the crowd. After the funeral, Superman and Peter Roslov speak at Stalin's monument about the future of the Soviet Union, and how Superman does not wish to become a public servant, but rather stay as a worker helping the common man. And meanwhile in the US, Lex Luthor resigns from the Star Labs and calls Lois that they are now officially in what might as well be called a paper marriage, as Bizarro's failure made him decide to dedicate the rest of his life in fighting Superman, and because he lost to Bizarro in a chess match. That is why he killed the research team, so no one will ever know besides himself and Lois. This issue of the story then ends, when Superman finds his childhood friend Lana Lazarenko in a line for destitute homeless people begging for scraps. This chance encounter then makes him change his mind about taking over the leadership of the Soviet Union in making it a better place for people like her and the others with her. Superman Red Sun issue 2. The next part of the story opens in 1978, where Brainiac has been introduced to the story during the time skip and put Stalingrad into a bottled city, because he apparently misunderstood Luthor's instructions to do that to Moscow. In retaliation, Superman captures Brainiac from his ship to ultimately fail to find a way to restore Stalingrad from Brainiac's database, which Luthor then takes a chance to rub onto Superman's face. In Moscow, Lana is revealed to have been given a job as a tour guide in the museum, showcasing Superman's trophies made from his mainstream enemies, that in this story have been turned into weapons that Luthor had created as attempts to kill Superman. Lana also provides alternate history exposition on how Superman's Soviet Union has spread across the world to be in every other country's ally by the extension of the Warsaw Pact. Discluded from that are Chile and the United States, which are told to be on the verge of collapse. At the price of India 
individual liberties where dissidents opposing this are turned into superman robots with brain surgery. This brings our attention to the civilian cloth Batman hiding among the museum tour and whom I am not going to bother calling Bruce Wayne. Why? Because we got his backstory in the previous issue and there he was just a child of a Russian activists who were executed by Peter Roslov for being anti-Superman and not as a member of a Russian version of the House of Wayne. Anyway, Comrade Batman goes to a bar to establish himself an alibi while passively warning the patrons not to repeat mistakes that led to his parents' execution and then goes to pull the opening of B for Vendetta. By that I mean he changes into his work clothes and announces that he has added the Superman Museum as a part of tonight's firework display. Comrade Batman also identifies himself as a terrorist by saying that the museum staff and the guest can oppose him by staying inside the museum as it blows up or vacate the premises before everything goes boom. Following that, Comrade Batman is pursued by the KGB while Superman's past tense narration speculates that he could have been anyone from all the people who didn't like living under Superman's Big Brother rule. And ultimately, Comrade Batman is able to slip into the shadows by making the KGB only capture a puppet in his clothing. Peter Roslov, who has by now become the head of the KGB, comes to demand Superman to use his powers to hunt Comrade Batman down, but Superman essentially tells Peter that he won't begin to hunt Comrade Batman down, only for him to be executed. Probably because Comrade Batman has shown that he gives the Russian people a chance to survive his attacks without directly trying to spread fear by discriminately killing them, so Superman lets him be for now unless he goes too far. Or that is how I understand it. Later Superman is shown working with Wonder Woman in rescuing workers on an oil tanker, and Wonder Woman reveals that in this alternate history, it was Richard Nixon who was assassinated in 1963, with John F. Kennedy still alive as the acting president of the United States, and he is doing a disgustingly poor job at it. Also, this version of Wonder Woman works as a precursor to the Injustice Wonder Woman by being secretly in love with Superman, who has Comrade zoned her. In the United States at the Daily Planet, Perry White's retirement party is cameoed by Oliver Queen, Barry Allen and Iris West, while Lois inherits the position of the editor-in-chief. All the while she is also in a loveless marriage with Lex Luthor, who acknowledges his wife just enough to tell her that James Olsen will be the next head of the CIA, and that the alien that supposedly crash-landed into Roswell, New Mexico in real life, is Green Lantern Abin Sur. And this scene ends by having Lois straight up tell Lex that she is tired of their marriage being like this. To which Lex responds by sarcastically asking why are they still married if she thinks so. Then while Superman and Wonder Woman's working relationship is given more substance on one page, Comrade Batman is shown capturing Peter Roslov into his Russian Batcave. He does this because Roslov had sent rumors go on the streets that he wants to speak with Comrade Batman, and here Peter shows his true colors. As he is not happy with how Superman ended up taking over running the Soviet Union, Peter has communicated with Luthor in the West, and they have discovered what may be Superman's weakness. Spoilers, it's not kryptonite. They want Comrade Batman to be the one to use this weakness against Superman and kill him so Peter can take his place. Comrade Batman is naturally not happy with the idea, as he remembers Peter Roslov as the man who killed his parents, but ultimately he agrees to the mission in seeing him as a lesser and easier evil to go after once Superman is dead. After that, Comrade Batman goes to rescue a western scientist named Ray Palmer from being turned into a Superman robot, and there he runs into multiverse traveling Jason Todd and Donna Troy, who help him escape with Palmer. Outside, Kyle Rayner's Green Lantern helps them with the armed soldiers, but Donna has to stay behind to keep Superman from catching them as she is taken captive by Wonder Woman. At Comrade Batman's Batcave, Jason and Kyle are disappointed that this Ray Palmer is not their Ray Palmer, whom they are looking for in the DC multiverse. Instead, he is the local version, whom Superman had initially reached out to try and make Stalingrad big again, but he was then arrested 
arrested for abusing his atom powers to steal state secrets and was sentenced for lobotomy. So, not a total loss, since they managed to get the man saved from a fate worse than death, and Comrade Batman gets to ask for everyone's help in his upcoming death battle against Superman. This help includes Jason and Ray helping Comrade Batman capture Wonder Woman as a lure to what happens next, and now we get to Superman's birthday party at Moscow's Winter Palace, where Thaddeus Sivana is established as a Western defector, and Lana is explained to Queen Hippolyta as someone paid to keep her mouth shut for knowing too much about Superman by Dieter. There Superman notices Diana's absence before his birthday fireworks end up making a bat signal on the sky, and Superman eventually hears Diana's voice calling to him from an abandoned detention camp in Siberia. And while Superman charges to reach Siberia in a 10 second time limit he is given, Jason and Kyle rescue Donna from the reprogrammed Brainiac guarding her. At Siberia, Comrade Batman using Wonder Woman tied to her own lasso, lures Superman in to a position where he activates the red sunlight lamp that causes Superman's powers to essentially be switched off to give us an obligatory Batman vs Superman fight. During which Comrade Batman roasts Superman on where the red sunlight idea came from and how instead of killing him, Comrade Batman is going to throw Superman, now rendered powerless, into a cell under the Siberian detention camps to live as so many others Comrade Batman has known and lost. Superman still tries to fight back but is not strong enough under the red sunlight and is eventually thrown into the underground cell, which is stocked with enough food, water and other essentials to make it quote more humane unquote for Superman than for the previous prisoners of the camp. Then we get something strange I don't know how to describe. Superman is somehow able to communicate with Wonder Woman. Never mind. According to a quick Wikipedia search, the then recent post-crisis Wonder Woman, on whom this version of Wonder Woman is clearly based on, did indeed have a version of a super hearing, and that is how she is able to hear what Superman asks of her. So, Superman asks that Wonder Woman breaks herself free from her own lasso, no matter how painful it might be, and destroy the generators powering the red sunlight lamps. Diana has to struggle after Superman implores to their friendship and everything they have built together, until she breaks free and destroys the generators despite Comrade Batman begging her not to. And so Superman is freed from his cell, with his powers back so that even Kyle's Green Lantern ring can restrain him, with the lost Comrade Batman being told that after being lobotomized, he will be put to work in a bank in Moscow. Comrade Batman, however, chooses to martyr himself with the bomb he had Ray Palmer as Atom put into his body, and as his final stand before blowing himself up, Comrade Batman let Superman know that it was Peter Roslov who betrayed Superman for him. In the aftermath, Wonder Woman is either aged slash rendered white-haired from the incident, and she ultimately leaves Superman's side, as he chooses to focus on Jason, Donna, Kyle and their monitor who got caught in the explosion, instead of on her after she suffered to help him. Ray Palmer is however able to blackmail Superman into letting them go by shrinking down into the bottle city of Stalingrad, and threatening to grow back into his regular size inside it if he doesn't. As Jay Jason, Donna, Kyle and their monitor are allowed to leave Earth-30, Lex Luthor is brought to the New Mexico by JFK to show him Abin Sul's crash-landed ship and his Green Lantern ring that never went to look for a replacement for some reason, other than that the story needed it to come into Lex Luthor's hands to start fine-tuning and mass-copying it. This issue ends with Superman's narration revealing that he became more controlling following Peter Roslov's betrayal. More freedom fighters adopted Comrade Batman's image to oppose Superman's rule in making him the symbol of their rebellion after Comrade Batman's martyr death, and Lana finds Peter Roslov being lobotomized when tending to the physically and mentally would wonder with Peter also revealing to Lana that Superman has begun to build himself a fortress of solitude. Superman Red Sun issue number 3. The third and final issue opens in the year 2000, when the entire world has been reverted into communism, where every adult has a job, every child has a hobby, everyone sleeps 8 hours a day, and even the weather is controlled by Brainiac. 
In Superman's Mountain Fortress, we see what became of those Batman-inspired freedom fighters cleaning up the place, as Brainiac reports to Superman that their rule over Earth, among other things, has increased life expectancy to 112 years, suicide rates are down, and birth rates are on the rise, while Lex Luthor has not bothered to call out how this can lead to overpopulation problems, because the United States is a war zone at the brink of starvation that Superman is just going to allow to die out because Lex Luthor is busy working his way into becoming the president of the United States while rebuilding it from its ashes. Not out of the kindness of his heart, but just to spite Superman while to Lois' sorrow that also includes the demolition of the old Daily Planet building to have something else built on its place. Moving on to what was set up at the end of issue 2, President Luthor and his Vice President Olsen arrive to their discovered version of the Phantom Zone, which does not have any Kryptonian prison held in there, and witness Hal Jordan as this story's version of Green Lantern. Hal's backstory in this story is explained as him being a Vietnam War veteran, who spent four years as a POW of the Viet Cong, where he managed to hold on to his sanity by the mental exercise of building virtual concentration camps in his mind, and that is what eventually made him the perfect candidate to have the required willpower to have the Green Lantern ring. The Guardians of the Universe were unable to be reached for a comment. Then we are shown how Wonder Woman, after what happened in the previous issue, is now bitter against Superman and views him with the same misandrist way as she does in with the rest of the male population. So naturally, when Lois is sent as an envoy to ask Wonder Woman if she and her Amazon warriors will support America in sending their Green Lantern Corps against Superman, Diana naturally complies to that. Before this attack happens, Superman has been distracted by dealing with a normal-sized bug that somehow made its way into Stalingrad, and scolding Brainiac for having made its citizens live in a bottled city. Brainiac, however, moves that conversation into the possibility of America attacking them soon, and how they could have avoided it if Superman had simply made them comply by force. And then Luthor just casually walks into the room, having somehow managed to bypass all the fortress defenses. As they speak, Hal Jordan rallies the Green Lantern Marine Corps, which among with the Amazon army, Luthor deems as surplus with his own mind being his most dangerous weapon against Superman, and Brainiac seems to take that literally as he then restrains Luthor and imprisons him inside his mainframe, as Brainiac's 12th level intellect has calculated that quote, Luthor could have talked Superman into suicide in 14 minutes, end quote. And letting Superman know that the Green Lantern Corps are approaching, Superman tells Brainiac to prepare for a full-scale assault on the US West Coast while he goes through the Green Lanterns and they can convert it to Washington to seize the White House together. And I don't think I need to fully describe what is essentially an action sequence, where Superman blows his way through the Green Lanterns, whose morale drops the more of them are taken down, how Wonder Woman and her Amazons are essentially bitch-slapped out of Superman's way after he warned them to stand down, how Metalloparasite, Doomsday, Livewire, Kimo, and I don't recognize who this is supposed to be, are released on Washington to slow Superman down, while Brainiac has already made it to the Washington Monument. Superman arrives to the White House to confront Lois, who as the First Lady is not giving in to his attack, and following her husband's plan, makes Superman, who is approaching her murder, Mercifully, to use his X-ray vision to read a sealed letter inside her pocket. And reading that letter then hit Superman home harder than Brainiac could have calculated as its message, why don't you just put the whole world in a battle, Superman, ends up bringing Superman down to his knees, likely in reminding him about Stalingrad as his greatest failure, and how he has been treating the rest of the world almost the same. Brainiac reminding Superman of his presence causes Superman pretty much to say all that out loud, in recognizing himself as just as bad as Brainiac before he was pre-programmed to serve Superman. Brainiac, however, is not easily convinced to stand down, and fights back in revealing that he was never reprogrammed, but rather played along to manipulate Superman to really be under his control. Also, here we get the only instance of 
what could be mistaken as kryptonite in this story. However, as Brainiac imprisoned Luthor into his mainframe, Luthor is connected into Brainiac's ship from where he is, and manages to turn off its power to let Superman fly in and shut Brainiac down. And then a self-destruct sequence is turned on in the ship, which gives Superman an out from his desperate situation by flying Brainiac's ship off planet and seemingly die in the explosion, while leaving Luthor to take over everything Superman left behind. For the rest of the story, Superman's narration tells that the story of how the Soviet Union fell and Luthor took over it after being re-elected as the president of the global United States in 2004. He then started to cherry-pick Superman's and Brainiac's original ideas, which when pushed forwards began to turn Earth into a utopia, where the life expectancy skyrocketed to the minimum of 800 years. After siring his own dynasty, Luthor died at the cusp of the fourth millennium, and he was buried into Lexor City, formerly known as Metropolis. There the elderly Superman is revealed to have been survived to fake his death to be able to live among the humans, in a Clark Kent resembling identity, and an elderly Lois almost recognizing him. But the story does not end here, as here is the part where Grant Morrison supposedly gave Mark Millar the idea how to do the ending. Based on this letter that Jerry Siegel had originally sent to Russell Keaton in 1934, a prototype version of Superman's origin would have gone like it did here at the end of Superman Red Sun. In the far future where our yellow sun has turned into a a red giant, Lex Luthor's legacy had the humanity evolved into the most advanced species in the universe, and the Luthor lineage has led to the latest descendant to be a scientist named Yor-Al. And as we know from the scientific prediction of our sun turning into a red giant far in the future, Earth will eventually be swallowed into it after Mercury and Venus. Which your Al wants to save his young son Kal Al from by sending him on a rocket to the past to stop this grim future from happening. Unfortunately, the rocket slash time machine, when arriving to the past of 1938, ends up landing into the rural Ukraine, so close in the causal loop of predestinational paradox that led it to being sent to the past in the first place. Okay, let's start with me telling you about one of DC's most critically panned story events known as Countdown to Final Crisis, tie-in series called Countdown Presents Search for Ray Palmer. That series was about Jason Todd, Donna Troy and Kyle Rayner's Green Lantern searching for Ray Palmer's Adam, who had gone missing after Identity Crisis, from all the random 52 parallel Earths in the DC multiverse as it was at the time. Countdown in general designated Superman Red Sun to take place on Earth 30, and so, Jason Donna, Kyle, and a monitor being their designated driver, ended up visiting there along with other Elseworld story worlds. The events of that tie-in issue were not written by Mark Millar, and so they are not in all likeliness part of the original story. But that didn't stop Alan Burnett, who did write this issue, to acknowledge certain gaps in the narrative of the original story, and managed to fit what happens in this tie-in issue into those gaps. Feel free to ignore it as canon, or take it as answering to certain questions, such as how did the under-budgeted comrade Batman, who didn't have Bruce Wayne's pre-Joker war fortune to fund his operations, manage to capture Wonder Woman and get that bomb inserted inside his body? The issue did fit the story, but otherwise the cameos of Jason, Donna and Kyle feel out of place, so better to ignore them unless you want to acknowledge them as the part of the story. Okay, with Countdown out of the way, let's focus on the actual main story now. For a story that Mark Millar seemingly had written for most of his life before pitching it to DC Comics to publish, it clearly has its pros and cons. For example, it's not clearly just a what if Superman grew up in the Soviet Union story, but also what if Lana Lang and Pete Ross also grew up there as Russian citizens with Russian names? What if the Wayne family does not exist in America and someone else in Russia became Batman? What if the Guardians of the Universe ignored Abin Sur's death while leaving his still functional Green Lantern ring for Earthlings to use? What if Oliver Queen never became Green Arrow and worked at Daily Planet along with Iris West? What if Barry Allen was never hit by a lightning and never became the Flash? And based on that ending, what if Krypton never exists? 
existed. So Superman is really a future human descendant of Lex Luthor and Lois Lane. Because Millar took a lot of freedoms when he wrote this story, and some things here only happened because he needed them to happen. AKA the story moved the characters instead of the characters moving the story. How about just putting Superman into the Soviet Union and keep Batman, Lana Lang and Pete Ross in the United States with the other DC characters, like Lex Luthor, Lois Lane, while also keeping Jimmy Olsen as a photographer. Also, what kept the other heroes besides Wonder Woman, The Atom and Green Lantern from becoming a thing? Now, is there anything positive for me to talk about and not nitpick out of this critically acclaimed Eisner Award nominated Superman comic? Well, the art by Dave Johnson, Andrew Robinson, Walden Wong and Killian Plunkett served as good visuals in telling the story and setting up a tone in all three eras of the three issues. Also, the revelation of Superman not actually being a Kryptonian was somewhat well foreshadowed by not having the symbol of the House of El make any appearances how the bottle city of Kandor was substituted for Stalingrad with Russian citizens instead of Kryptonians, how Brainiac never made any references to Kryptonian civilization in his database, or even called Superman a Kryptonian, or how Kryptonite was never brought up as a way to take Superman out. But that still didn't stop Millar from letting the word Kryptonian slip into the dialogue in issue 3, from Lex Luthor of all people. As I showcase in that letter from Jerry Siegel to Russell Keaton in 1934, this version of Superman was more based on the earlier versions of Superman, like the original Golden Age version and the prototype version described on the letter, by having Superman having landed on Earth in 1938. If Superman Red Sun were to have done this to any later versions, such as the Silver Age Superman, the Bronze Age Superman, or the then modern post crisis version of Superman, then this would have been a completely different story. Also, when I was having trouble finding words to describe this comic, I went to ask my Twitter followers for their opinions, and Robert Willing, who does Protege's Noob series on comics here in YouTube, put it like this for me to paraphrase. Superman Red Sun showed the best sides of Superman even when he is in the wrong. He was unfortunately raised with the values that risk running into dictatorial and ultimately ends up in it. Superman still wanted to do what was for the best, but in the way of socialism. AKA, the story had Superman be written more in line with how he is in the mainstream comics, but when he is being raised under socialism, he is more tolerant to those methods in seeing them as the norm. Combine that with Alex Luthor, who is only going after Superman as an intellectual rival whose inferior clone beat him at chess. And that way, this also turns into a story without a good guy and a bad guy. Just neutral people with flaws, and that is where I must recognize where the critical acclaim is truly earned. And then Robert also pointed out a too early out-of-character behavior in Superman's actions, where he had been lobotomizing political dissidents into Superman robots long before Brainiac was reprogrammed after putting Stalingrad into a bottle, and Comrade Batman out and Peter Roslov as for having betrayed Superman for him. Even when Superman took the methods of socialism for granted, I agree with Robert there in making those lobotomized Superman robots be something that should not have been introduced randomly between issues 1 and 2. Instead it would have hit harder and made a little more sense if the first case of lobotomized dissident was shown and what caused Superman to start using that form of punishment in the first place. And now I think it's a time we moved on to the animated adaptation. If you already didn't get it, I wrote most of the script up until here first and only watched the adaptation before writing the following things I have to say. 
The screenplay of this animated movie is credited to J.M. DeMatteis, a very prophetic writer for DC and Marvel, which naturally makes me question if it was him who made the changes in this movie, or if someone else had made them and he wrote them down from the guidelines given to him. The movie opens well enough in showing what Superman told Peter Roslo from his childhood, as well as introducing Superman to the world as a Soviet superpower through a propaganda film. But then when it comes to the incident with Sputnik 2, that is where the downhill starts. Instead of having the bronze globe of the Daily Planet fall off as collateral damage for Superman to catch and let his actions speak for themselves, he instead decides to speak to the onlookers who um, include Lois, and that leads to a later interview session. And this interview session tries to substitute for the conversation Superman had with Peter Roslov, whose absence in this story makes Superman look worse instead of neutral. The interview with Lois leads to Superman discovering a lead shielded ghoul from a dossier her husband Lex Luthor told her to give to him, and there he finds Lana among the political prisoners, because she knew Superman as a child. And then she dies when freed along with everyone, which leads to Superman avenging her death by killing Stalin, before taking over the leadership of the Soviet Union. Let me remind you that Superman in the Red Sun comic NEVER KILLED ANYONE, even when it would have been the preferred option. Following this, Superman begins to expand the Warsaw back to the rest of the world by ending the Korean War and tearing down the Berlin Wall while essentially telling the world they are free to join the Warsaw Pact or else. I'm sorry, I thought this was supposed to be Superman Red Sun, not INJUSTICE! Now let's talk about the changes to the other characters. Lois and Lex Luthor's marriage is portrayed like a night and day from the comic, where Luthor's obsession to one-up Superman causes marriage with Lois to decay, but not ultimately fall apart. Instead, they have a healthy and happy marriage throughout the entire film, where Lois somewhat proudly witnesses Lex flex his intellectual feats. And just like Superman, Lex Luthor is painted more as an imperfect genius taking on a given challenge, rather than be the vain mad genius who ended up killing all the witnesses who saw him lose a chess match to Bizarro. Wonder Woman is introduced after Stalin is killed, so her mother does not accompany her, and so Stalin's suggestion for Superman to start a dynasty with Diana comes from him, only to be shot down by her, because this movie decided to make Wonder Woman be straight up lesbian for having grown up on an island full of women. If you ask me, it would have made more sense to have Diana become a lesbian after Comrade Batman had used her as a hostage to lure Superman into a trap and her hair turned white, along with her heart breaking over Superman not caring about what happened to her. And then it is here during this event when Bizarro, who is given a more original name in Superior Man, directly attacks Moscow in a fashion that should have been taken as a declaration of war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Bizarro also has a stereotypically sad death in being overcharged with powers while seemingly being remote controlled by Luthor, instead of in stopping a wayward missile in foreshadowing Superman's would-be death in the future. Then when we jump into the events of the second issue, Brainiac is shown how he takes Stalingrad and puts it into a miniaturized sized form inside a bottle before Superman defeats and reprograms him. The Warsaw Pact has been used to make every other nation an ally to the Soviet Union, by force, and Comrade Batman has only two appearances to appear in, as a rush excuse to make Wonder Woman end her comradeship with Superman. In the first one, he doesn't give the Superman Museum staff and guests a chance to evacuate before blowing it up, and the second one is rushed into, as the movie didn't include Peter Roslov as a contact between him and and the West to get the red sunlight lamps. So the movie just expects the viewers to accept that Comrade Batman just got his hands onto them somehow, and managed to get Wonder Woman captured as his lore. And Wonder Woman herself is flanderized to essentially be a parody of what she stands for, by being such a developing misandrist that I'm surprised she even bothered to care about a lobotomized male dissident. 
If it was a female one, I would understand better with this characterization. And then we reach the aftermath of the shallow Superman vs. Comrade Batman fight. Since the movie didn't have Peter Roslov to betray Superman and for Comrade Batman to out as a traitor, Comrade Batman's suicide without a final word makes him come across more like a coward than as a martyr willing to die for his cause. And then Wonder Woman, after breaking herself free from her lasso, without Superman asking her to do that, Diana breaks up their comradeship simply because this experience that Comrade Batman put her into and Superman saved her from, simply because she now sees them both as the same, simply because they are both men. And unlike in the comic, where she did that because Superman didn't pay attention to her injuries, here Diana still does that when Superman is asking her if she is okay. She's oikeesti, mitä vittua? What kind of lazy rewrite is this plot point? Oh, and the three acts are set in different years, pretty much like in the comic, like how the first issue's events are set in the 50s, but the second and third issue's events are set in 1967 and 1983, instead of 1978 and the year 2000. Probably because the filmmakers didn't want to have the characters age too much to get too old. Covering the final third of the movie, Lex Luthor becomes the president of the United States after John F. Kennedy, the Green Lantern Marine Corps are established pretty much like in the comic, except that I would compare the difference between the two Hal Jordans to twins who were separated at birth. And among the Green Lanterns we have Jon Stewart and Guy Gardner making a cameo as casualties when Superman eventually responds to them attacking Russia. Wonder One makes a pointless final appearance in her final misandrist form to cry about how she hates men now instead of backing up the US after Lois asked her as the first lady. And since Stalingrad had only one token appearance, Superman is eventually stopped at the White House lawn when Lois shows up before him carrying the bottled city. Which essentially ends up taking away from the defeat Superman got from Luthor's pen is mightier than a sword attack in the comic in symbolizing how he is ruling over the humanity while also following it with an another the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story change. Just the way you wanted it. What are you saying? I've spent decades trying to restore them. You're telling me that Brainiac couldn't have done it at any time. Brainiac was damaged when I found him. We tried and tried to undo this, but... Actually, actually sir, the, the restoration, restoration technology, technology was, was always, always available. available. Superman is told that Brainiac could have supposedly always restored Stalingrad, but didn't because Superman never asked him to. Which on itself is complete bullshit, as the comic had Superman go over Brainiac's database and subroutines and found no way to do it, while Luthor also hypothesized that Brainiac wouldn't even have one because why the hell would he? Brainiac collects data and has bottled cities as samples that he naturally wouldn't need to restore back to their original sizes. That would be counterproductive to his prime directive as a collector of worlds. Finally, Superman has to fight Brainiac with Luthor fighting alongside with him, in what, by the way, is the only time the two interact in the movie. And then Superman gets the same out he did in the comic by flying Brainiac's self-destructing ship into space. And after that, the movie then decides to end right here in the 1980s. Without Luthor taking over Superman's led Soviet Union as it falls, but instead stepping down from his position as the President of the United States for his Vice President, and retire with Lois somewhere remote and private, rather than use his intelligence to create the utopia and dynasty shown at the end of the comic that led to his ancestor Yor El to send his son Kal El into the past to become Superman in the story. That was something that could have been shown as a montage during the end credits. 
while showing the rocket landing into Ukraine in the past in a post credit scene. I realized now that I had some negative criticism on the source material, but watching this movie, it almost looks like to me now as if it was made just to make the comic look better. Which seems counterproductive to the animators who, if they are fans of the comic, would have been expected to do a better job in bringing the comic to life. But no, these animated movies seem to be only made just for the sake of it, and if they are expected to be adaptations, then we should always automatically expect them to be downgrades. Casting wise, there were some interesting choices with Jason Isaacs doing his best to have a Russian accent as Superman, while Diedrich Baber as Lex Luthor was somewhat distracting to me, because that kept reminding me of him as Batman in the Brave and the Bold cartoon. Lois Lane was voiced by Amy Acker, which mostly made me think about her role as Ruth in Version of Interest, and her characterization in being married to Lex Luthor was, like I already said, a night and day difference from what was in the comic. One the other one was voiced by Vanessa Marshall in reprising her role from that Harley Quinn cartoon I have not watched, and I already said how her character was flanderized into a parody of how Wonder Woman's values are seen. Comrade Batman was voiced by Roger Craig Smith from Arkham Origins and the English dub of that Batman Ninja movie, which I should probably cover sometime in the future, while doing what passed for him as a Russian accent. And Bizarro was voiced by Travis Willingham, which probably led to him being cast as Superman in the Battle of the Super Movie. Paul Williams as Brainiac, however, felt like a passive performance that could have been done by literally anyone else. Like Armin Shimmerman, because this version of Brainiac from Superman Red Sun already looked like a visual inspiration for Dr. Nefarious. But in the end, this movie was a soulless animated adaptation that drew away from what I ended up acknowledging as my final praise track comic. The neutral atmosphere of the Cold War. Instead, this was a stereotypical America good, Russia bad kind of movie that made the Russian Superman an accidental bad guy and American Lex Luthor the imperfect good guy. As if to simplify it to children as a propaganda piece of which I I can't believe there are people praising it as a good Superman movie. It is not even a good movie on its own without the comic being compared into it, and it only ends up making everyone look bad by trying to make some of them look good. Wise words. Human nature or man's nature? Did I say 10 minutes? I meant 10 seconds. Men. Women, right? Come to me now, Ruski! But a man has to know when it's time to leave the stage. I'm now nearly a thing of flesh. How could you be so utterly incompetent? Okay, long video over now. And my next projects are going to be the recap review of Near Replicant version 1.22474487139. Which could end up as multiple videos similar to how I end up doing with Near Automata. And the next comic to adaptation comparison review will be on Batman Year One. While you wait for those, remember to like the video, comment what you think about Superman Red Sun as both the comic and the movie, share the video for more people to see, and subscribe for those other videos coming in the future. Dinging the bell for when I try to do gameplay streams again is also an option, and may your heart be your guiding key.